Good morning and welcome to the Northern Institute's People, Policy and Place Seminar Series for 2021. It's wonderful to have an audience in the room as well as online. Uh, this is our future and it means that so many more people are involved in our seminars. My name is Ruth Wallace, I'm the Director of the Northern Institute and the Dean of the College of Indigenous Futures, Education and the Arts here at Charles Darwin University. Today we start our meeting by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands and the seas on which we work and live. Uh, I particularly want to note that we are on beautiful Larrakia land today uh, and I want to acknowledge all Larrakia elders past, present and future and further extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today and all the custodians of the lands on which you are meeting us today. Today we have a wonderful new person who has joined CDU. We had a conversation recently and uh, we just have to get Christy here to talk about her work and to build connections uh, with others across the university. Dr Christy Watson is a lecturer with Charles Darwin University's Asia Pacific College of Business and Law. Today she's going to be presenting on a study she's undertaken to explore Australian First Nation philosophies with the aim of providing insights into how these might be better integrated into and inform contemporary business governance, which we know is just an enormously important issue uh, here in Northern Australia, but also nationally. Please note there'll be a Q&A session after the presentation. So think about what you'd like to ask. And uh, if you're joining us by Zoom, you can just log into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and, and put in your questions. I.e., please don't put them in the chat. We will be following the Q&A part of the Zoom. Uh, so now I'll hand over to Christy. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, hopefully we can get my slides up. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to come to our seminar today. Uh, I hope that uh, it will be informative and that we'll have a really great discussion around my uh, current research focus at the end. Uh, so I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and to pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, so, my seminar today, I will give a brief overview a brief overview of my professional background as it relates to the research that I have conducted and am planning on conducting. Uh, my PhD research informs the research that I will be undertaking, so I will give a brief overview of that as well, uh, and then move into my current research focus. Uh, so, that will take a approximately half an hour, uh, and then hopefully we'll have a nice discussion afterwards. Uh, so I have uh, quite an eclectic professional background. I haven't listed everything here, just what uh, might be relevant for this presentation and my research focus. Uh, I've worked predominantly in the education sector for the last 15 or so years, uh, which is probably most of my life because, as you can tell by my qualifications, I'm a bit of a serial learner. Um, so I've worked uh, quite extensively with First Nations students and on programs and initiatives that help to encourage participation and retention of students in educational programs. Um, I also work in uh, postgraduate studies in management and leadership uh, development uh, and have also worked with a number of industry partners to develop um, leadership development programs. Uh, and I've dabbled in some entrepreneurial activities in that space as well through my own business. Uh, so I've also held a number of uh, senior management and leadership positions, so I have the insider uh, insights and experiences that help me in developing those programs uh, and helping people to engage with industry initiatives. So I'll give a, a bit of an overview of my PhD research. Um, it might feel like we're going off topic a little bit, uh, but it'll uh, hopefully come back. Oops, that's jumping ahead. Um, It'll come back around to, to looking at philosophies in general in the workplace. So for my PhD, I 
study uh, the application of the principles of Stoic philosophy in the workplace. Uh, for some of you, Stoic philosophy might be a new concept uh, that you some may have some information on, um, others may have some misconceptions on, uh, because it has been interpreted in different ways over time. So essentially, um, around 300 BC, the first school of Stoic philosophy was formed uh, by Zeno of Cyprius. Um, and, but the actual thought process and the thinking behind Stoic philosophy has, uh, was evolving for generations before that through um, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Uh, but the difference with Stoic philosophy was that there was very much a focus on community um, and contributing to the common good. So their ontological perspective was that our intention should be to live a life of virtue in accordance with nature. And the way that they saw that we would do this was to engage and practice with three main principles. And they titled these principles physics, ethics, and logic. Uh, so physics was an acceptance of what is within our control and what occurs by nature. So what is within our control is our own behaviors, thoughts, and actions, and everything else is outside of our control. Ethics was building an awareness of what is right and for the common good and how we contribute effectively in that way. And logic was a systematic process of developing wisdom through our experiences and practices. Uh, so my research question in my PhD was, in what ways are the ancient principles of Stoic philosophy being applied in contemporary workplaces? And I wanted to capture the circumstances under which participants were engaging with Stoic, with Stoic principles, why they were engaging Stoic philosophy in their workplaces, and which principles specifically they were engaging with under those circumstances. I also wanted to understand the benefits and the challenges that they were facing using a philosophy that may not align with the philosophy within the workplace and to determine the nature and characteristics of that philosophy within a contemporary environment. So my methodological approach was a sequential exploratory mixed methods. I started with a qualitative and quantitative survey which was promoted through social media channels that were dedicated to the practice and sharing of practice of Stoic philosophy. Uh, and at the end of the survey, the respondents were asked if they wanted to participate in an interview as well to share their experiences. So the design of the interview was a reflective process um, where I asked the interviewees to share their experiences and some examples of, of some of their experiences with applying Stoic philosophy. So from the information I gathered from the survey and the interviews, I was able to interpret the results through an inductive thematic analysis uh, to draw out the main themes that arose through that data. Uh, I was then able to use the Stoic philosophy framework that I showed a moment ago as an a priori uh, deductive analysis to align those themes with Stoic philosophy. So for my survey, I ended up with 55 respondents from over 40 locations and 17 countries around the world. And for my interviews of those 55 survey respondents, I had 19 participants in my interviews from eight countries and 17 uh, different locations. And as you can see from the list, there was a wide range of different professions and experiences of the interviewees. So everything from a vet to an artist, military, um, pastor, IT professionals, uh, geologists, writer, um, and they worked all over the world and they had some really interesting experiences from um, active combat in Afghanistan to working in Algeria under bodyguard circumstances and very confined spaces. Um, so those were some of the scenarios that they were using for philosophy uh, to navigate within professional workplaces. Uh, so the results of my study indicated that there were a wide range of um, workplace scenarios that these participants were applying to a philosophy to. Uh, and I was able to, whilst the, all of the principles were used across scenarios um, and as I showed earlier they are, are all interconnected and fluid. 
there were some scenarios where some of the principles were more dominant than in others. Uh, so by way of example, uh, ethics was very much applied where there was the need for interacting with people um, and ensuring that those contributions were to the benefit of not only the person interacting, but who they were interacting with. Uh, logic was uh, very much associated with decision-making processes and working through um, some emotions, perhaps, that might um, sway how we make decisions and, and affect those, those decision-making capabilities. Uh, and physics was uh, applied predominantly in scenarios where people felt out of control, um, so perhaps they had lost a job um, or had to move uh, or had a new manager or whatever the scenario was that was outside of their control. Through my thematic analysis, I was able to uh, identify six main themes that emerged and then align those with the uh, principles of Stoic philosophy. Uh, so again, physics, the acceptance of what is within our control and outside of our control, very much aligned with the theme of the dichotomy of control. And through people's um, comprehension of what was it within their control and outside of their control, they were then able to focus on their practice as to philosophy rather than on things that are outside of their control. From an ethics perspective, uh, an awareness of the common good definitely emerged as a theme within the experiences of the interviewees and survey respondents. Um, and as they developed this awareness, they felt more comfortable providing advice to others who might be struggling in, in similar circumstances. And with regard to logic, uh, emotional regulation was actually the top theme that emerged across all participant experiences. Um, and you may, if you know or have heard of stoicism, it's often uh, depicted as a very cold and uh, detached uh, way of interacting. Um, it's actually, that's actually quite a misconception. So what it is, is it's about understanding our emotions and our responses and being able to navigate through those in order to respond appropriately to the circumstances. Uh, so the participants really found that useful, particularly in highly emotional um, or uh, excitable workplace environments, uh, which then of course led to better decision making and a calmer approach to how they were making decisions. Uh, so also interesting for where I'm going with my next research focus, uh, there were some challenges and benefits that people found as they experienced um, their applications of Stoic philosophy in the workplace. Uh, the challenges uh, were really interesting and uh, often involved uh, some frustration or friction within workplaces. Um, which emerged as they were trying to practice a different philosophical approach to what was the norm within the culture of the workplace, uh, which is important for, for where I'm going with my research now. Uh, but they also found a number of benefits. So they were better able to, um, they, they felt they had improved their interactions with others, they felt calmer, they felt less anxious and more compassionate. Um, they were able to regulate their emotions and they felt that they were able to make better decisions and free themselves from some of those cultural expectations within their workplace. So what am I taking from my PhD work that can inform my current research? Uh, so what I found was that as people built a greater knowledge and understanding and appreciation of different philosophical perspectives, they were then able to practice those within their workplaces um, and often were able to alter their experiences within workplaces and, and at times other people's experiences as well. But what I also found was that workplaces can actually become a barrier to genuinely integrating different philosophical practices particularly where there has been a dominant philosophical position that has informed the culture of that workplace. So my current research, uh, I'm taking my experience with looking at philosophical practices and, engage, oops, jump ahead again, uh, and engaging the Australian First Nation philosophies and how we can better integrate those into our contemporary workplaces. 
so the context of this research, from my perspective, is that there is a legacy of colonialism within our business dealings and, our, and the way that we run our businesses, which has displaced a lot of the First Nations knowledges and practices uh, and worldviews or philosophy. Um, so in order to genuinely integrate these, um, my approach is that we need to better understand these philosophies and then work on how we can integrate the philosophies into a business context. Uh, so again, my aim is to explore Australian First Nation philosophies to provide insights into how these might be integrated and inform contemporary business practices. There are some key informative studies that I'm using to guide how I am choosing to approach my own study. And these studies come from First Nations peoples in Canada. I don't know why I'm just jumping ahead, sorry. Um, First Nations people in Canada, Africa, and the United States. Okay, so I'll give a brief overview of each of these because the, the findings are really quite interesting. And I won't outline all of the findings, just the key findings from these studies. Uh, so the first one uh, is from Canada, where 15 Canadian Aboriginal leaders were interviewed, eight women and seven men. Um, and they were from the tribes, uh, not exclusively, but in part from Matisse, uh, Ojibwa, Mi'kmaq, Iroquois, and Mohawk tribes. Uh, Eleven of those participants worked in mainstream Canadian organizations, and four worked in Aboriginal organizations. Uh, so, and they also came from a range of public and private sector businesses from education, public health, community development, government, technology. Uh, so these are really interesting studies and I really very much encourage people to have a look at them. There are some fantastic findings. Uh, but to summarize the findings of this particular one, um, I draw on a quote uh, from the paper, which says, Aboriginal leadership draws upon spirituality as its central facet, engages in consensus decision-making based on cooperative behavior, concentrates on developing harmony and fostering respect among people, and has the needs of the community as its raison d'etre or its way of being, its reason for being. The second study uh, was undertaken in West and Central Africa. Uh, so for this study, there were also interviews undertaken with a range of uh, leaders, community leaders, elders, and um, what they termed as ordinary people. That's not my terminology, that's from the paper. Uh, as well as group discussions that allowed for uh, the representation from the main language groups and the demarcation of the tribes. Interestingly for this study, uh, it was also an autoethnographic study. Um, so the researcher actually lived within the communities uh, for a cumulative period of six months and then followed up uh, for the next two years on, on various elements of, the, of, his, of their study. Uh, so that allowed them to, to produce um, an understanding from their, from their perspective and their experiences as well. Uh, the main concept that emerged through the study was that the most recognized indigenous African concept, which has emerged in leadership studies, is the philosophy of Ubuntu from South Africa. The general premise of this concept privileges interdependence, humanity, community building, benevolence, respect, and responsiveness. Uh, so the next study was conducted in the United States, the Northwest Plains, Northwest Plains, Midwest, Southwest. Um, the, the demarcation between the US and the Canada was, Canada was obviously not recognized by First Nations people, so this study actually um, progressed into Canada as well, but it was study under US research. Uh, so again, uh, a number of participants who were specifically uh, leaders of organizations that were tribally owned, um, and various levels, uh, or quite high levels, uh, within those organizations. Uh, they only interviewed six participants, which they acknowledged was a uh, limitation of the study, uh, and there were no female participants, which they also acknowledged was a limitation of the study. 
Uh, so their main finding was that American Indian leaders define self through their collective identity, which is heavily influenced by tribal uh, affiliation and tribal culture. And they often talked about having a foot in two worlds, so trying to work within contemporary business environment while uh, being true to their the tribal cultures and philosophies. Uh, and this paper was actually more of an a, a, uh, uh, information from extent studies and literature available historical documents and journals. Uh, and it looked at the Blackfoot, um, the Blackfeet uh, tribes across the US and Canada. So they basically collected information on the different practices and ceremonial uh, practices of these tribes. And what they found was leadership is distributed throughout the social organization in a way that maintains a social equilibrium between all elements within the future. Authority or rule lies within the social structures and ceremonial protocols. And egalitarianism is achieved by ensuring that no particular individuals or groups yield absolute power. So, summarizing those studies uh, in my own words uh, from reading through them. Uh, the First Nations philosophies in those countries or within those tribes that were studied, uh, egalitarian interdependent community is very much a focus of their philosophical practices and their cultures. Uh, so they have a non-hierarchical social structure of participation and contribution. There is a strong sense of metaphysicality of their presence in the world. Uh, so they look at look very much long-term and cyclical in their decision-making. Uh, we might compare that to the way that we approach some of our decision-making in our contemporary businesses. Uh, we can often make decisions that are right for the time. Perhaps we might look three to five years ahead, maybe a little bit longer. From their perspective, they were taking the knowledge from their entire generation, their entire culture dating back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and they weren't making a decision for themselves at the time. They were, so for example, with the Canadian study, uh, they had a, a perspective of seven generations. So is the decision we're making today going to benefit or still be a good decision in 500 years time? Uh, so the scale of the decision making was much, much bigger than what we tend to think of in, in our terms today. Uh, and spirituality and symbolism is really important across the board as well. Uh, so again, drawing on the Canadian study, the medicine wheel as an example, was really about making sure there was a balance of well-being for every individual and the community as a whole, uh, from a mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical perspective. So it's a little bit different to some of the practices and philosophical approaches that we see in contemporary business environments. Um, we often see an individualistic approach where we're encouraged to meet performance targets, um, achieve higher hierarchical standing or positions, um, and it's often ego-driven rather than a collective um, approach to how we're contributing to the community as a whole and common good. Obviously, there's some gray areas in there. I'm just um, sort of making a comparison. Uh, so my main points from uh, what I've undertaken so far in my research and preparing for my current research project uh, is that ancient philosophies are already an integral part of our, our contemporary business context. And the reason is, is that individuals bring their own culture and their philosophies into the work. Uh, the problem is, is that they're not always recognized within the workplace, and if they are recognized, they're not always integrated as well as they could be. Um, so we might recognize that somebody has a different philosophical perspective or wants to do things in a different way, uh, but they're often constrained by the business structures that we have in place or the practices and the governance. Um, so from my perspective, to genuinely engage Australian First Nations perspectives, uh, we need a systemic and guided integration of these philosophies within our business contexts. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we need to 
build greater understanding of these philosophies uh, in order to foster this integration into our um, businesses. And what I mean by that is that we need to move beyond a quantified representation. Uh, it's fantastic that we have diverse boards, uh, management committees, and uh, input into decisions. Uh, but unless we understand the underlying philosophies of these people, um, and obviously there will be variations across different uh, tribal groups and, and areas, uh, but unless we understand these cultural philosophies, uh, we can't really integrate their ideas into how we're conducting this. So my plan is to add to this body of research uh, by looking at the Australian perspective. Uh, so my current project that I'm just starting on and hoping to get some input and insights from yourselves uh, is to explore Australian First Nation philosophies to provide insight into how these might be better integrated into and inform contemporary business practices. Uh, my focused location at the moment is Australian North Northern Territory, Darwin, Catherine, and Alice Springs, uh, mostly because of the demographic and the experience that I'm looking for at the moment um, would be within uh, the business context that, that First Nations people are working within. Uh, but I do plan, hopefully, to expand that after my initial study. Uh, I will use a semi-structured interview method methodological approach again. Uh, and the participation uh, that I'm hoping to have is First Nations business persons and five listed board members, managers, leaders, and entrepreneurs, not because of any hierarch hierarchical authority that those positions offer, uh, but because of what I want is people who have experience working within a business context for some period of time, um, and those positions tend to involve people who have been in the business world and have been walking into worlds, as they say, for some time, uh, and getting their, uh, learning about their experiences and their perspectives. So my next steps, um, I did manage to get a little bit of funding through the College Research Grant Scheme, uh, which will help me this year and hopefully a little bit into next year as well. Uh, these seminars are uh, very useful for me to get industry and research input and insights from yourselves as to how I should be going about it and different ideas. Uh, ethics approval is um, I'm working on, uh, and obviously there's the uh, additional factor of working with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants, uh, which reg requires additional processes to be put in place from an ethics perspective. Uh, and then getting participants. So I'm hoping to have around 20 participants. Um, we'll see how it, we go, uh, it, and it'll depend on where saturation is achieved as well, with regard to whether or not I'm, I'm getting any new information to continue to, to uh, interview more people. Um, but I uh, have been talking to various industry people who about uh, what I'm planning to do, uh, and they feel that there couldn't be any problem um, getting participation into the study. Uh, and those are my contact details. Um, wants to recommend uh, or put their hand up for participation in the study. And that's it, that's me. Please join me in thanking our presenter, Dr. Christy Watson, and for everyone who's joined us online. You can hear the echoes of clapping as everyone's doing that down wherever they are. Now we're going to hand over to questions, and it looks like we're starting here physically. Uh, Christy, I think you're going to hand over. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to hand over to Christy and your insightful questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we. Going in the room first, or yeah, no, it's put up one online. So okay. I'd suggest that we start here, and then you'll see that I'll start to pop up. Okay. Any comments or questions from the room? Yes. Christy, uh, my name is Mike. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and I, I like, um, yeah, the direction you're going and what you, you're attempting to achieve. Um, for roughly the last fifty years. Various state governments and federal governments have launched lots of initiatives trying to 
um, involve Indigenous people here in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and so on, in business development opportunities. Um, you mentioned the word including, inclusion of Indigenous philosophies, I think, to better understand and therefore, I assume, bring a higher degree of success somehow in, in, in those initiatives that different organisations have developed. But have you substantiated the fact that perhaps the initiatives that we have developed aren't working? So in, in other words, this goes, you know, right to that, the, your thesis as to whether it's actually valid or not. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, yes, so uh, many of the studies that I've already had a look at um, actually recognise uh, exactly what you pointed out, uh, is that there is not necessarily a, a genuine integration of ideas. Uh, so whilst we are integrating uh, perspectives and insights into the development of organisations, they're still set up with an Anglo-centric approach of a hierarchy um, and various governance um, protocols that may not align with the philosophical practices or the cultural practices of First Nations people. Um, so we saw in my presentation the differentiation between uh, the longevity, for example, of how they look at, at um, their lives and, and their contributions. Um, there's not an individual sense of um, you know, that ego or individualistic uh, driven decision making. Uh, so there are a number of concepts and, and philosophies which I want to better understand before uh, making any solid comments around what, what works and what doesn't work. Um, but, and it's not necessarily uh, um, taking one philosophy over the other, it's just suggesting that the um, First Nation philosophies have been um, pushed out of uh, the business models that we're currently practicing within. Uh, and bringing people on board uh, is a great step, but we need to understand where the um, frustrations or the points of friction are with having those people effectively contribute to the business models. Does that answer your question? Uh, it's a big question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's really important to substantiate because it's the it's the pointy end of what you're doing. Ultimately, I assume what you want to be able to do is influence um, government level policy and, and practices in terms of um, assisting with the development of indigenous related business practices. Yeah. And there it actually is, I come out of the field of tourism. Um, and I know that there's actually a lot of work being done. There's a lot of Indigenous um, projects which have been initiated by Indigenous people themselves. Yeah. Um, so there actually is a fairly substantial amount of like, practical kind of work out there and also research about that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that will help to inform one study as well, is how well they have been able to um, walk the two worlds and, of making sure that their cultural elements are integrated into those businesses. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. My name is Tom. Um, and I think uh, some of the, the stuff that you're bringing out is really important, uh, not just for business world, but for uh, uh, government bureaucracies and in institutions like this one. I'm just uh, wondering uh, about your own. Uh, positionality um, and uh, your perhaps you know, from an honest watchful position, you know, where you stand and how that might influence your ability to be able to uh, elicit uh, First Nations positions. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, I come forward into the research with uh, an exploratory mindset, uh, knowing that I don't know what I don't know. So I'm certainly not approaching it from the perspective of this is what I think and this is what I'd like people to tell me. <laughs> uh, it's very much about drawing out what people want to share um, from their own experiences uh, without imposing my own um, perspectives on that. Uh, obviously I have an interest in uh, diversity and integrating different philosophical practices. Um, in my work and professional experiences, that's how I've 
also encountered a number of scenarios where there is a clear de demarcation of when people walk into a workplace and, and have to leave their cultural beliefs at the door, um, which I think we need a lot more work on. Um, not not only in with regard to First Nations philosophies, but other cultural elements as well. Um, so I just uh, I, I come at it with very much a perspective of wanting to learn rather than imposing my own views and maintaining that, that researcher distance from from those perspectives. I assume that you, you well, I mean, I shouldn't you, that you you you're I guess reflexively aware of your own. Uh, uh, philosophical backgrounds and uh, you know, position, uh, whether or not you want to share that with uh, other people or not. But uh, yeah. just I, I guess I guess what I'm trying to get to is how can you ensure that there will be integrity in the uh, those First Nations responses when you're the one that's interpreting them and you come from the, perhaps a different position ontologically yeah. uh, and epistemologically than they. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, what I found with my PhD, um, which uh, I, I thought was a positive PhD for me personally, uh, was as you start to understand these philosophical practices, um, you find yourself engaging with them um, as a researcher. Uh, and so whilst I didn't, um, there was much discussion, uh, but I didn't end up doing a lot of it perspective in my PhD, but it was certainly something that I could have done had I set it up from the beginning. Uh, but you naturally, I have found, start to become more and more curious about these philosophies as you, as you become more familiar with them. Um, so there's definitely that element, and there may well be that element within the um, research that I undertake that I begin to understand and, and actually adopt some of those philosophical practices. Um, from an analysis perspective, obviously there's processes to, to put in place to ensure that um, I'm not necessarily uh, putting forward my own philosophical perspectives. Um, but at the same time, uh, once I gain an understanding, so for example, with Stoic philosophy, once I was able to understand the philosophy itself, I could come up with a priori framework um, and be able to align the themes that came through um, with that, that, that framework. Uh, so perhaps that, that may be an approach I can take with my current research is once I identify uh, the main themes through this initial process that I might be able to provide some sort of framework that can be used to move forward and put, putting some criteria around that. Got something. Um, okay. Uh, I suppose I should read it out. Uh, so, a question online. Thanks, Christy. Your research sounds incredibly valuable as someone with extensive experience in business, including on board and the way that boards operate varies widely. I feel that the best engagement of First Nations people requires a balance of power between Indigenous and non Indigenous directors, uh, reflected in numbers and practices. How important is to tie this back to philosophical underpinnings, yeah. So that's basically the essence of um, what I'm looking at. Uh, we can have um, quantified representation of equal representation, for example, of, of Indigenous and non-Indigenous board members, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the philosophical or the cultural elements are being appreciated and adopted within the board. Um, so we have a number of governance structures, we have um, charters, we have um, you know, practices that we have to operate within business context. Um, and they don't, are not necessarily reflective of or appreciate, appreciating the different philosophical perspectives. Uh, so if I go back to uh, one of my summary points, which was the longevity of, of which um, First Nations cultures often think about decision making, uh, that may not be something that a board, for example, is thinking of, of their decisions and how those would impact seven generations from now. Um, we're seeing a lot more uh, recognition, for example, with uh, climate change and various sustainability initiatives that we do need to start thinking that way again, come back to that sort of perspective. Uh, but 
over the past uh, several decades, it's certainly been a more immediate return perspective on decision making. Uh, so absolutely getting people in the room and having a diverse board and group uh, is absolutely essential, but we also need to have form a better understanding of the different philosophical and cultural elements that people are coming to the table with. Uh, okay, from Ellie. Uh, thanks for a really interesting presentation. The past research you, was, you have mentioned is all based outside of Australia. Is this because within management leadership studies there are not studies in Australia on this topic? There is quite a large body of research on Indigenous entrepreneurship yeah, in Australia, uh, which maybe, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah, there, is a, there is a fair bit um, of work that um, I'm still working through. Uh, the reason I chose those studies in particular was uh, a couple of reasons. One was that they really um, outlined the particular approach that I wanted to take with my study. Um, but also I wanted to show that it's not just an Australia-centric um, challenge. Um, it's actually a global um, consideration that is receiving more and more attention. Um, and Philosophy is, um, has, is one of those things that has also been pushed out of our, uh, our general day-to-day -day context as well, isn't it? Um, and when I first started uh, looking at philosophy, um, I, I really, myself, did not understand how it integrated with our day-to-day -day lives or even what it meant, really. Um, so those studies were very much focused on the practices, the philosoph philosophical grounding of Indigenous and First Nations perspectives. Uh, which is the element that I feel is missing from a lot of studies that are, that are being undertaken. Um, from my perspective, we need to go a lot deeper into those perspectives to really genuinely integrate them. Yeah. Um, can I ask you about, okay, so from Lee, can I ask if you intend to speak to bodies such as Indigenous Business Australia to see what they might have to inform your research? Yeah, absolutely. I've already um, started putting out um, my uh, the word on my research um, and, and connecting with um, various organisations. Any others on the Oh. Uh, why you use the keywords of stoic and not persevering? Um, uh, not sure how to answer that. So stoic philosophy um, is more than just perseverance. It's a it's a whole philosophical practice. Um, so it, it's perseverance may be part of that, but it's quite a, a different. Um, different terminology altogether. Uh, have you presented your thinking for some periodicals? No, I haven't. <laughs> That's what you do, but I'll look into it. Uh, how many experts put their efforts in the field of study? How many experts put their efforts in the field of study? Um, more and more, I think. Uh, there's, there's a greater awareness of um, studying uh, Indigenous and First Nations perspectives, um, in particular from, from my, uh, in my field in the business area. Uh, so there is, there is more coming. Um, at the end, okay. Any others from the room? Yes. Um, yes, yeah, so, um, just going back, uh, I'm thinking of the Yukon, um, that's how you pronounce it. Gorge Caves issue with Rio Tinto, Rio Tinto yeah. <laughs> blasting the caves. Yeah. That might be a really good example of the clash between two business philosophies, sorry, two philosophies um, in, in operation. And I wonder if you can't sharpen the direction you research with references to that and to other instances where there has been a clash. Yes. Because ultimately, to get the attention, to make a real change, oh, well, yeah, you, you, I think you've got to go in at that kind of level. And you've got to get media attention for what you're doing 
in order to get grant money. And I think you've got to aim at that sort of level. So I think if you can sharpen that sort of information. The question the gentleman raised before about your positionality too, um, I don't know whether you, you've thought of or have, have used critical friends from, say, the community or the industries in which you're working. But that's a good way, you know, there's a, a simple qualitative assessment of your validity and reliability sorts of issues, and it, it really is important. But it also offers you the opportunity to, you know, train Indigenous people in, in the sort of the research that you're doing. So that's a really good strategy um, for, for, for doing that. It can help strengthen quality of your findings, defend against those sorts of issues, and Themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you raise a really good point about the clashes between uh, philosophies and approaches to business. Um, and there are a number of them where certain acts um, on business uh, go absolutely against how a First Nations community would approach um, that particular uh, circumstance. And, and often what we find is economically driven rather than philosophically driven. Uh, and so we need to really understand how uh, those perspectives can be integrated more effectively, uh, which again, I, I think is becoming more and more um, apparent as we enter into um, one of the climate change debates and how we look after our world. Uh, so the First Nations people, regardless of where in the world, a very strong connection to nature and the world and our place in it, um, which has been overshadowed uh, in the last industrial ages and the like, which are very much focused on production and economic benefits, um, which often aren't the degradation <coughs> of our environment. Uh, so that's a key area where we're clearly not uh, integrating First Nation philosophies in how we're making decisions. Well, we might um, let people kind of drag you away and have a chat with you on the veranda, I suspect. But um, look, thank you so much, everybody, for participating. It was wonderful, Christy. Really interesting work. I hadn't hit the stoic work before at all. So you opened, I've got a whole new set of reading. I've got another set of reading from our book launch last night, and another set from today. So that's all good. Um, so we wish you the best for your research. Look forward to seeing things moving forward. Um, I hope we now make contact with a whole lot of people who are on the side and able to help with the territory context. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much.